thank you for joining us. Um, this panel is on digital events, and we've gathered together some pretty inspiring examples from throughout the country, uh, from organizations, companies, uh, festivals that have managed to reinvent what they do or, you know, grow what they have already were doing um, for the new digital age. I say that the digital age is if it's we've not already been in that for the last you know decade but <laughs> certainly throughout the pandemic it's been very very important um we're imagining this is a fairly relaxed uh, place if you have any questions uh, please use the q a function or the chat function i'll try and keep my eye on it as well uh, katie and i will be here if you have any technical questions or concerns uh, please just uh, pop them in the chat, uh, Katie will, will deal, they'll, uh, be able to deal with that. Uh, we have also have closed captionings, which you can select uh, at the bottom there. Um, and I believe they're dealing with that right now. Okay, so just uh, to introduce everyone, uh, I'll just go around the panel and just uh, say your name, who you are, and uh, who you're representing and why you're here. You know, why the digital events, why, what did you do? Uh, so firstly, uh, Graham Main. On you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Graham Main. I'm a producer at the Big Born Supper um, in Dumfries, which is a, a social cooperative based in Dumfries. Um, we're a sort of participatory um, arts organisation, non-profit, and we produce a, a major event every year that usually attracts between, on average, 26 to 32,000 people across 11 days. Um, and I suppose before, actually, I would always have considered myself to be a live producer. So it's funny now, actually, that that when someone says, actually, I do digital as well. But I don't know why I called myself a live producer, because really, actually, what I think I was is a community producer. And I think there's lots of things. I think what, what this has kind of given us to think about is really who that community is um, in terms of are they are they in your doorstep or are they? Are they uh, far and wide? Um, in terms of our own organisation, actually, we the first event we ever did for Big Burn Supper, I was trying to reflect on this today, was a, an outdoor event um, across in the, the White Sands, and it was basically four giant screens. Um, and somebody said to us, do you want us to stream it? And I think it was a live radio. And all they did was just stick a, a webcam in front of the 24-hour in Dumfries, so the T4, as it's called affectionately. And, and that was our live stream. Uh, the, the quality was awful, uh, but but I think we I think it just shows at the time Martin you were saying about, about a decade there um, that we've sort of been living with it. I, th I think we, we've sort of generally wanted to be digital, uh, but perhaps what's happened recently is sort of compelled us to be to be more digital. So looking forward to sharing some of the things that we learned. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, next up, Mike Press and Hazel White. Hi there. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, great to be here. I'm Hazel White. I'm Mike Press. And we are in the same bubble, if anybody's worried that we're not socially distanced. Um, we are based in Dundee and we run a company called Open Change. And um, a year ago, or just over a year ago, we were delivering mainly training courses and um, doing design support to organisations, mainly in the public sector. So a lot of NHS work. Um, Scottish government, charities, helping people think creatively and redesign their services and their businesses. And then this time last year, everything we did got cancelled. So um, mo most of the things we did, we used to specialise in, in three-day introductions to design thinking. So you'd have 30 people in a room for three days. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. It was fun. You'd have Lego, loads of post-its, Sharpie pens. Great. Lots and lots of fun. And it finished. So we thought, what are we going to do? Yeah. So we had a bit of a, yeah. I mean, it was a bit scary for a while for yeah. everybody, you know, for all sorts of reasons. But, you know, that was all our income had dried up, everything had been cancelled. Um, and we started doing other work. I started doing um, illustrations for doctors who needed quick information on, um, you know, how the services were changing with COVID. But then you had the idea of setting up a gathering for people involved in the design community, in service design specifically in Scotland. Yeah, I, I'd heard of this thing. I hadn't heard of it before. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Zoom. And I thought 
this might be quite a useful tool. Why don't we use this just to get together people that we kind of knew and we'll have a weekly kind of one hour session because we were like everyone else, we were feeling isolated. We were feeling vulnerable, a bit scared. We weren't talking to anyone. Let's do this once a week on Zoom. So we just started doing that every week. We're still doing it. Now it's every fortnight. We have up to 70 people joining us um so you know from around the world maybe from scotland probably about 60 percent from scotland the rest from other countries we learned so much from that that we could then apply into other things yeah so that's yeah that's where we are today and yeah. so everything that we do like most other people is all online yeah, yeah. fantastic uh, thank you so much and thank you for being here uh, next up jess bruff Hi everybody, thank you for joining us and you'll have to bear with me if I seem incoherent at times, I'm an hour, I'm an hour ahead of the rest of you because I'm in Spain at the moment and apparently my brain stops working after 5pm but I'll do my best. Um, I am one of the organisers of Fringe of Colour Films which is an online arts festival, an Edinburgh based online arts festival um, and it started from uh, a much simpler concept, this Fringe of Colour back in 2018, which was a sort of database and network for black artists and artists of colour who were coming to the Edinburgh Fringe to perform and who we wanted to support and shout about their work and show their work with other, other audiences and other artists who were looking for them. So I'd created this um, Google Sheets back in 2018 that listed all of those shows and shared it publicly on social media and through emails. And then that sort of continued into 2019, combined that with a free ticket scheme um, that we were able to set up by collaborating with the Fringe Festival. And we sort of planned on growing that into 2020. So we'd been talking with the Fringe Society about you know, the kinds of performances that we wanted to make sure we were offering free tickets to again. Those free tickets um, themselves were going to audiences who were also black people, and also people of color to attend those same shows. Um, and so we were in that, in that kind of point of talking about doing that project again. Um, and I was working with Scotty, which who are website designers based in Edinburgh um, to, create our own website for Fringe of Colour for the first time, kind of like a box office to help distribute those free tickets to our network. Um, and then everything was cancelled and we had to have a moment of thinking, you know, is this, does this mean that Fringe of Colour just won't do anything in 2020? You know, if there aren't any shows at the Fringe or the other Edinburgh festivals that we work with throughout the summer, um, the book festival and the international festival if there are no shows and there are no tickets and there are no free tickets so does that mean that we're kind of obsolete you know there aren't shows for us to be shouting about um, and it was a tempting moment at the time to think maybe this summer we could take a break and actually relax in August because I'm, I'm also in my I'm a PhD student I'm in my third year at Edinburgh University and it has been a challenge to balance that <laughs> with, with arts initiatives, I have to say. But um, as time kind of went on, looking at what was coming out of the digital um, performances, um, you know, the shows that were in the, the archives of the big theatres that had been filmed, you know, immaculately, these incredible productions of Shakespearean plays at the National Theatre down in London and other theatres based around the country. I was starting to notice that we weren't seeing the types of shows or the types of artists that Fringe of Colour was trying to support and trying to promote um, throughout the, the period that the project was running. Um, and we weren't seeing those artists, you know, find, find commissions um, to make new work uh, in that period of sort of late March to, to April. And so in April, we, myself and um, a friend of mine, Hannah McGurk, who had worked with me in 2019 on the spreadsheet, we thought that maybe what Fringe of Colour needs to do is transform beyond its sort of ticket scheme um, structure into more of a producing type of platform, which is a, a big, big leap from Google Sheets. Um, but yeah, we ended up and we ended up creating um, our very first online arts festival, working with uh, a lot of artists that we'd met in Edinburgh 
either from performing or maybe they were working at performance venues and weren't performing themselves. And also artists around the world. We ended up with a month long online arts festival that ran through the whole of August with 51 films, um, eight of which we uh, commissioned and produced ourselves, 11 of which we co-commissioned and co-produced and a bunch of other films that were sort of just spontaneously submitted to us for screening at the festival. Um, and we're now gearing up to, to do it all over again um, in August. So cutting it down to two weeks this time around um, and slightly fewer films, but with the same kind of aims and hopes because we're very much in a similar sort of position with lockdown and restrictions. And again, artists who are kind of being left behind. So yeah, that's sort of the, the very small, <laughs> the um the potted history of fringe of color films but oh, it's fascinating and really inspiring and thank you for for joining us um first things first i suppose um you know once the pandemic hit and we all kind of referenced that point um oh right what now <laughs> what work can you talk each of you uh, talk us through the kind of steps like how did you design or adapt an event uh, once you realized that it couldn't happen if I can ask uh, Mike and Hazel yeah I mean so the typical things that we were doing Mike talked about doing a three-day you know that we typically used to do three-day workshops I mean you can't do that online I mean people's it's just exhausting being on zoom for any period of time <laughs> So we've reduced things into much um, tighter formats, much shorter formats um, that actually have to be much better scripted, much better planned. Um, in a way, I think possibly the content has been sharpened because of that, you know, because you have to, like, you can't wing it. You can't say, oh, well, we'll come back to that after lunchtime if we forgot to do it in the morning. You know, everything has to be really, really well scripted and planned. And it means we've cut a lot of the chaff out of what we do. You know, it's just, is this really important? Is this really valuable to the audience? Is this what they want to hear? Um, so, yeah, it's really pared things down. I, I think initially there was there was a lot of denial about it on everyone's part. You know, you'd be talking to clients and they'd say, oh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll just delay it for a couple of months because we'll all be back at work. You know, come come June, we'll all be back at work, won't we? And <laughs> as each day went past, you thought, yeah, it's, it's probably not going to quite work out like that. And then it all went very quiet. And then people say, no, actually, we're going to have to rethink this because this is, this is going to go into the long term. So there was a certain point after a few weeks, then people were thinking, right, okay, we have to, we, we are gonna have to do this differently. And I suppose what we started doing before we got to that stage, we started anyway, going to everything online that we could just because we've got nobody else to talk to, you know? So you say, oh, someone's doing a Zoom about something I have no interest in. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll sign up for that. So you're going along to stuff. And what was interesting was that, well, first of all, it was great that there were things online and, and, and so forth, but you very quickly realized certain things worked really well. Certain things didn't quite work as well. So you'd begin to figure out, well, okay, once we start doing this, we'll have a bit of this and we'll try doing, doing it with that. But you were trying to bring in inspiration and ideas from all kind of areas that you were involved with. Um, yeah, so that, that was it. In this first phase of it, you were looking for inspiration, looking for things that would work, and also figuring out, well, okay, well, when we do start doing stuff again, how's that going to happen? And as we were saying at the start, we were doing this weekly thing, this weekly gathering, as we called it, um, where we were learning a huge amount about how you, how you made events engaging and interactive um and above all comforting because one, one of the things that we found quite early on was that lots of people were doing things online all about being productive and how do we deal with covid and actually i don't know about you but most people weren't that interested in covid they they were just quite lonely and a little bit scared and they just wanted to talk and so yeah we started focusing on that really I think that's that's a really interesting point, and it almost um, 
slightly uh, misleading just uh, the title of this kind of panel it's digital events it's really more like digital events amidst the global pandemic <laughs> you know so you know there are programmatic choices and content choices which you then have to make uh, as you just mentioned about uh, the comfort so moving to a digital platform i suppose has not removed the um you know the importance of context and the importance of, of of you know maintaining conversations and what's really interesting jess what you touched on there within the fringe was that many organizations returned to a kind of safe comfortable place where they stopped challenging or stopped having those kind of conversations have you found that change somewhat over the past you know year six months um i would like to say yes but I personally have not seen the, the bigger structures, the bigger institutions being as daring as they may have been pre-COVID with the work that they're producing. I think the places that I found really interesting that have kind of navigated this move to the digital, which includes equipping their theatre makers or their performers with the tools needed to get to those spaces and also think about you know which audiences they're reaching that they may not have been reaching before those are coming from the more um the, the smaller or the more independent um organizations out there but that's not to say that there have there haven't been incredible productions from you know national theaters around the country mm -hmm. i just personally feel like the smaller organizations have been able to be a bit more malleable i think with a structure as big as something like the fringe society you know they they're not a cultural they're not a producer uh, really they're not responsible for um you know funding artists to make new work or providing that kind of um that that kind of equipment really to, to actually produce the the work that goes out on that program um, and so without the work, they don't have a program They're, they, yeah, they create a program and they work with venues to, to make the fringe. So I think the bigger an organization is sometimes the more difficult it can be to navigate a, a massive, massive change in, in what they do. I don't know if that's maybe I'm, you know, maybe people want to <laughs> disagree with that, but that's kind of where I've seen, that's why I've been looking at the smaller venues or not venues. Well, some of them are venues, um, the smaller organizations to see, you know, how they, how they have switched, have they incorporated things like Zoom into performances in a way that works? Have they managed to come up with a way to keep people safe and film staged performances, that kind of thing? Mm. Um, who started to go down sort of more of the podcasting route or the audio, um, the audio kind of work uh, for some big venues, moving away from what they know and what they do is scary and difficult and expensive <laughs> and yeah so I think I did I answer that question yes, yes or no yes, I don't yes. know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, it some, leads, some have some have yeah sure. yeah yeah it leads on quite nicely just in terms of that uh, smaller organization and adaptability to Graham Main and you know the work that Big Burn Supper did in terms of the YouTube live stream with Janie Godley uh, of which I remember most of, and then in the end, I kind of, uh, uh, you know, as typical Big Burn Supper, I, I kind of uh, had a bit too much <laughs> yeah, 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 in terms of whiskey. Oh. Uh, but Graham, did you did you do you agree? Do you did you find do you find you're quite a small organisation? Did you find to switch? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I absolutely agree with uh, what you're saying there, Jess. In terms of sometimes the bigger organisations have um, too much clutter. Um, and also I think what, what, what you mentioned there reminded me that sometimes in the French festival, the, um, the sort of major players are being driven by, by monetization um, in terms of making their decisions rather than I suppose an organization like ours, which is, um, I always describe this, it's not that we are driven by the community within three or four days of lockdown happening, our community uh, were just ringing me off the hook saying, you know, what's Big Bun Supper going to do about this? And it's like, well, we don't have a cure for COVID, if that's what you mean. And actually, I think that that's kind of um, whatever your whatever your work draws its meaning. Um, in terms, you know, connectability. But for us, it was really about uh, realising that, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying there, Mike, for us, it was about about um, 
helping a local community or our community deal with isolation. Um, and, the, and the only way we, we could do that was to build conversations with artists. Uh, so the first, so for us, I guess the last year has been about a kind of process really, because the first thing we, do, we did was in about three and a half weeks and we failed miserably at it because the, the link didn't work. I think failure is really important here to, to let yourself fail. Mm. Um, but we got loads of artists in Dumfries um, who would normally be appearing at the festival hubs and they all just recorded really um, random pieces of, of uh, footage in whichever format they liked. Um, in fact, I think Martin, you guys did one as well, um, maybe on the second lockdown festival. And actually going through that process then helped us become uh, sort of editors really it was only when we did that and said, well, we've got nothing to lose. No one funded the work. The work just sat in our portfolio. And we said, we're, we're activating this because a community feel, a community needs us to. And that, that sounds a little bit contrived to say that like that, you know, that, um, you know, like the arts could be like a fifth emergency service. But um, I think once it gave us that meaning, it meant actually we could then um, be bold, be a bit, be a bit fierce, fiercer than say the bigger, clunky organizations and then within that we started to understand that everyone everyone had these stories to tell uh, famously there was young jack finley who who um he's a fisherman in kukubri and he just basically filmed himself on a on, on a gopro in the boat out of ross island um and then and then you know put, put a put a track under it by Rura, um and that was and that and that was really it it was just to simply all people really needed to do was really sort of connect with each other. And that led us into uh, Dumfries TV, which was, I suppose, going back to the original question, the challenge we had, I suppose, was standing back and watching all these things happening mm. and saying, which of these scenarios do we do we go with? And I think the thing that, that we quickly picked up is like that it's very likely that whatever scenario we do, we won't have a clue. It might be a hybrid option. It might be whatever. So we thought, let's just keep keep running the process. Let's keep telling stories and and having a play around. Um, and then you find some magic. We create a character character called Tourist Tam, um, and Tourist Tam was a loud up dumb feast. Do you know what I mean? But he was a he was clearly a wee Ned. But it, it was amazing to see how uh, you know Tam was able to sort of navigate through these empty streets of Dumfries uh, and sort of build that build that connection with the audience and. We didn't really intend for Dumfries TV to be anything of significance. It was a process that as, as artists, we wanted to go through that so that we could be active. Um, and I suppose for us, it was making the switch to go, are we still a theatre company? Are, are we still a producer? Are we now a TV producer? And actually, yeah, I guess that's the best thing really is just like get rid of all those uh, labels. Uh, yeah. We're just... We just are, I suppose, and, and, and that, that helped us uh, for the big event. And the big event, sorry, just to, I think, had slightly more, um, I suppose, was um, because people expect a big bond supper in terms of an 11 day festival. The decision we made, and I think it echoes what Mike said, is uh, short, short and sharp, straight to the point. So, not doing 11 days of programme, we just went at it with um, an hour and a half worth of content and then just. Uh, almost like just some, some mic drop, boom, you know, it was like, that's that's what we want to do. We know that people are going to be sitting at home with a couple of whiskeys. What will have the biggest impact, really? Yeah. Viva V yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant. And uh, what I'm latching onto there is that that drive to what you mentioned is keep telling stories. And I think uh, us as kind of creators and connectors uh, across industries kind of need to kind of hold on to that, whether it's stories or connections. Uh, there was a real powerful drive uh, and just to kind of move swiftly on to the kind of next point you touched on kind of failure there um, I guess <laughs> to, for, for everyone uh, what were the some of the unexpected benefits of an all digital event as opposed to a live event and uh, Mike and Hazel I wonder because obviously have you reached new audiences gathered new people is it you know increased yeah, I think but before that, Graham, there's a, a question in the chat for you from Angela asking, what's a wee Ned? <laughs> I don't know if I feel confident to, to answer well, that I, question. I so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, um, I suppose um, uh, it, it's an old colloquial word. It's not It's not a positive word. It's, uh, it, it's very bad that I used that word, actually. It's a negative word, I suppose, to describe people that maybe were brought up in housing estates. 
um, and that we had tracksuit tracky bombs. But if you saw the character, he was wearing kappa kappa tracksuit bombs, and he and he called everyone a bam. So I, I think I think I might I might have literally um, excuse to use it. Yes, a, a non-educated delinquent is it? That's uh, the word. That's yes, <laughs> that's the easier way of saying it. <laughs> Oh, we've forgotten what our question was now. Uh, benefits. Oh, the benefits yeah. of um, going digital. Yeah, yeah. What I love about it is, um, yeah, is that kind of focus time, you know, that actually you, you really have to distill stuff down. Um, but also it's the inclusivity of it. Because we used to run workshops for various organisations or whatever, and it tended to be in Edinburgh or Glasgow or Aberdeen or sometimes Inverness, if you were lucky. Um, which, but it was never in Dumfries and it was never in Shetland. And so since um, we've not been able to travel, we've been doing workshops where we've had people from Dumfries and people from Shetland all together and able to, to come. And also people who maybe couldn't have, attended those things before because of childcare, for economic reasons, for all sorts of reasons, can come along for a two hour session um, and you know can, can participate in a way that they, they couldn't have done in the past. And that's been a real eye opener for us. And you know when we're thinking of how we do things in the future, um, I think we'll change a lot how we deliver things to make it more, um, this more inclusive yeah. geographically in terms, yeah, for all sorts of different reasons. I mean, it's as a business, it's broadened our business. You know, last week we were running a workshop in Berlin. Tomorrow we're 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 carrying on working with a whole bunch of uh, community businesses across England. Now, we, <laughs> there's no way we would have done that before. So it opens up. Uh, we just finished quite a big job in London it's opened up opportunities that we never we never would have looked for because we wouldn't particularly have wanted to you know spend a long time maybe in london or whatever so it does open up those uh, opportunities of reaching in our case clients or perhaps markets and audiences mm. um that are far from your your own base no fascinating uh, a question from the um from the uh, from our audience here, from Annie Mars, which I'll direct towards you, Jess, if that's okay. Um, uh, a wee question or a thought for the panelists. Uh, is the experiences of the last year going to change the way that you approach events forevermore? I suppose that's quite interesting in your case. Um, you know, are yeah. you that way? <laughs> yeah, I guess we're gear gearing up to do Fringe of Colour films again. It's changed um, a lot of things, to be honest. I mean, we went into the process of setting up a festival without any knowledge whatsoever of what is required to, <laughs> to set up a festival beyond being people who have been to festivals in the past, being people who have gone to film festivals, gone to the Fringe, gone to the theatre, and thinking, you know, if we were to take part in this, what is the information that we would need to give and thinking also strategically about the website and what are the different elements that need to go on the website, the thumbnail, the synopsis, the credits, all of that. Everything came from a very, um, uh, the understanding of what was needed to, to set up the festival came from what was needed for the website. I think that was a good place to start. That was where most of my most of my background came from anyway because through my phd i've been learning about programming and and coding and html and all of these things so fortunately i came into that with with that sort of understanding um but we really learned as we went and i'm sure we made lots and lots of mistakes um this year we are doing submissions again open call for submissions and we have a uh, hopefully quite, hopefully quite good um survey that artists can fill out giving us all the information that we would need for putting those films online like the title of the film or the thumbnail or the link to the film very very obvious things that um are even more obvious to us now um and and the synopsis but we're also i think this year we're focusing more on i guess the longevity of the project and how people are going to the support that people are going to need um, throughout this period of lockdown and uncertainty about what live art is going to be like, those venues that maybe artists have relied on for their income and their livelihoods, you know, what happens if those 
aren't around sadly anymore after the after the lockdown or maybe are cutting down and don't have space for everybody what happens to those artists who have lost those opportunities and will continue to lose those opportunities and perhaps it's the digital that offers them a place to continue creating their work and being able to pay their bills from their work so what we want to do this year is find a way to um sort of help with that education, help artists move towards digital creation, thinking about the shows that they might want to make on stage and how they might portray that behind a camera, because it's not as simple as getting your camera phone out and filming yourself. It's uh, an entire education about angles and lighting and sound, and that also connects to the, you know, the listenability of the, of the performance. If your film is not easy to listen to, you're excluding a whole bunch of audiences who might struggle with their hearing. If your film is not, has lots and lots of flashing lights, you're excluding a lot of people who might have epilepsy. And maybe you don't need those flashing lights to make your poetry film that has nothing to do with flashing lights. Things like this that, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't taught how to make a film, like most of us weren't, you wouldn't necessarily think about. So. We're trying to incorporate more of a development um, branch to Fringe of Colour Films this year through workshops for all of the artists who will be taking part in the festival. Um, we're also continuing with our writing platform from last year, which for me was a really good education on responding to art and how, how it, easy it is to move away from the very, very uh, sort of quantitative structured way that we have all sort of come to accept crit critique about art and reviews you know this five star system that looks great on a poster but is horrible for the internal feelings of an artist and you know this this i'm talking about the, the fringe of color responses project that we set up last year in tandem with the festival where writers of color and, and black writers responded to the films at the festival um, and sort of personal essays kind of combined yeah like an essay in a review sort of style um, but crucially was not a review and that project was quite a um, I suppose it was quite a daring one because you know it cost money and it required um, hiring writers and working with an editor and doing all these things again that we'd never done before um, mm. working with people we'd never met um, but you know you get a good feeling from somebody and you go with it and yeah it was just such a the way that the writers responded to the work was so natural and so easy that you think why haven't people been doing this um, for all kinds of artistic work why have we accepted this version of response which is very much uh, these are the good things about this show. These are the bad things. Overall, it was fine. Like yeah. that's that's not connecting with um, anybody. So I, I really am excited to see how that develops as well. Part of our um, development tool is uh, working with writers who are part of the team to improve things like how to pitch to uh, magazines and online platforms so that they can continue to write for other, other platforms, not just Fringe of Colour. Um, Essentially, we want everybody who was involved in the festival or who is involved in the festival to, you know, leave August with a set of tools that allow them to engage with lots of other platforms where they can get lots of other work and continue making their amazing projects and, the, and their amazing um, creative work because we're only around for a couple of weeks a year um, and we need people to, to be confident in these spaces that are so new to them. Yeah, that, that's really, really inspiring. And it's amazing that you've, that, you know, this has actually given such a launch pad to that, to that, you know, through your kind of participative uh, approach around the program that has developed almost this new program and skill sharing and skills development for that. It's really, really great. I've got, there's a couple of panels from the uh, panels, a couple of questions uh, from uh, the audience and around kind of access and inclusion. And now, it's certainly something that's come very much within my world um, as a you know artistic director um, on a digital kind of means. We we often kind of look at you know participation in the widest sense possible, but um, it's been really interesting lately having conversations with members around uh, inclusion. So um, I'm just seeing how I can refine these questions. Um, 
So one from Kate Ross is, uh, what do you suggest is good practice to make sure digital events are as inclusive as possible? For example, those regard, uh, for example, regarding digital poverty or for accessibility for those with sensory or learning disabilities. Uh, I suppose Mike and Hazel, um, do you have anything to contribute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, on the first base, it is trying to make sure that things can be accessed on all sorts of different devices is a first up. Um, but also, in the type of work we do, we do have the luxury usually of being able to ask in advance what we can do to support people to make the experiences as enjoyable as possible for them. Um, so we are normally um, able to, you know, just to, to think about how to, to do things. I mean, having said that, you have to design everything so as you can cover as many eventualities as possible. You know, that should be your, your baseline standard. We tend to use um, closed captions on Zoom um, at all events that we do. We try to give information out um, in advance um, if we're using slides, et cetera, et cetera. What we have found is that um, also making sure that people um, are made to feel comfortable at, at muting themselves and turning off their cameras um, so they don't feel they need to show themselves because that's exhausting. Um, you know, just being on screen all the time is exhausting. And I think that makes um, things a bit more welcoming for people who, you know, who don't want to show their face. You know, it's fine to take part and you don't need to have your camera on. You don't need to, you can be mute throughout the whole thing. We use breakout rooms a lot as interactive um, parts and also to just to be absolutely clear that you know going into breakout rooms like going into the kitchen at a party you know some people love it some people absolutely hate it you know so that they don't need to they can stay in the main area and um, they can just switch off just to give people choice and agency as to how you know in the same way as you might do in a venue you know you can pop outside if you want to if it's all getting too much etc but it does give people in terms of just being able to you know see it on your own terms I think digital does have some advantages, you know, because you can just switch off in a way that you might not have work, walked out of one of our workshops. <laughs> you know, if you've had enough, you can just turn the sound off. Um, I don't know. What I, you think. I think some of the things you have to do seem uh, seem quite trivial and obvious, but actually aren't that obvious. So with this gathering that we do now every fortnight, I spend the first two to three minutes explaining how Zoom works. You know, if you if you click up here, you can toggle between uh, gallery view and speaker view and so forth. And the chat window icon is down here. And someone said, well, why, why do you keep doing this? And we said, well, be because this isn't for the cool kids. You know, you have to assume that there will be one person out of that 70, there'll be one person who has never been on Zoom before. Are you trying to make this inclusive and accessible and open and welcoming? Or is this a closed club? And so it, it is about, you know, for, for many of us, these technologies are very new, actually. Well, for me, you know, I've only been using Zoom a year. And so we, we have to make it as accessible as possible. I mean, the question also, you know, uh, Kate was also referring to digital poverty. That is a big issue. That's a huge issue. And it's something that I think collectively we have to we have to work on and come up with other other solutions too. But it's just making while we are using this, we have to make it as accessible and welcoming and as understandable as possible. And one of the things, because as you see the wall of post-its behind us, I mean, we used to run, you know, workshops with people at tables and getting up and they're sticking stuff on walls. And it's only through the last year we've realised how uncomfortable that is for some people. You know, that thing of actually having to get up out of a chair and walk across a room in front of people is, you know, is actually quite an exclusive thing to do. And you have to feel quite comfortable in yourself to do that and giving presentations and show and tells and the digital's allowed us to just mediate that in a different way. You know, we use digital whiteboards where actually you can do things silently and with more reflection in them. You know, that people have the options as to whether they want to appear on screen if they're presenting something. People can make videos. There's different ways of doing things. It's made us be much more aware of things that we could do better face to face as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's really really great. Um, it's certainly on, on on our part, it's been quite a learning journey uh, because it was it was, you know, I think we were working within a sort of 
an angle of access and inclusion, a certain element of it, when in fact the spectrum was was so much larger. When you're and now what's been brought up to the forefront is digital inclusion and digital access and how you're using platforms and um, exactly what you just said there. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, just just to further point there, Mike and Hazel. Um, have you found that you know the people that you're engaging are are they more neurodivergent? Are you know based on a question here from Angela? Um, I don't, we, it's not something we we, we would necessarily gather data on, but we just do have just a much wider audience than we had before. Um, we we it's, it's just in, the gathering is so interesting in that you'll have. Um, somebody standing outside an operating theatre at the Children's Hospital in Glasgow beaming into the event and you'll have a sign writer using scrubs, using scrubs yeah. and you'll have a sign writer in Dundee, you'll have a student, you know, you just have this whole mix of people who just wouldn't have met in, you know, in any other world and feeling comfortable and, you know, creating friendships. Yeah. And we also have an offline Thing called um, randomized coffee trials where we pair people up um, and they meet once a month to have a chat and we thought it was part of the gathering um, but it's actually it's got its own separate life there are people who don't come to the gathering at all who pair up and meet for coffee with a different person every month and um, some of them come to the gathering some of them don't um, and I think that's just different types of people some people like an online event and some people just want to have a one-to-one -one experience but in a sense that's a digital platform still you know and and it it is enabled by this technology and it's triggered by this technology and, and I think that's a really interesting thing. I mean, listening to everybody talking, there's this huge amount of innovation taking place, an absolute massive amount of innovation um, that we can all learn from. And I think it's actually in, it's in the, the smaller organisations and individuals working away where you've really seen this absolute flowering of different ways of doing things, which is hugely inspiring. Marsha, would you mind if I also respond to this? Because I think it's a really important question. And one of the one of the things that I'd, I'd learned from attending the bigger festivals in um, in Scotland in the summer is this notion of continuous work and constantly, constantly as an artist, constantly having to push yourself and put yourself out there performing at least once a day for a whole month if you're at the fringe, minus one day off when you then find somewhere else to perform, that kind of thing. And I think the way that festivals sometimes run excludes a lot of people, a lot of neurodiverse people, a lot of folks with disabilities, you know, fatigue, anything that restricts movement. And the nice thing about online arts festivals is that you can choose, you know, you can choose how long their event is going to run for you can choose how long they have to create that work and send it to you things are a lot more flexible especially at the beginning because nobody really knows what you're going to be putting out there anyway nobody knows what your program is going to look like um how long things are going to run for you can kind of create that in mind of the artists and their capabilities so we were working with a, a, a few sort of deadlines last year um where artists had to submit um, their films to us by a certain date um, so that we could get those ready for the platform but those were always soft deadlines so if an artist couldn't make it for the week that we were hoping to um, put their film in the program then you know they would have another week to, to get back to us with that work and that meant that we actually had a few films by artists who were still working on their um, on their performance until the last minute, until they were ready to share it with us. Um, and had we had that strong, strong deadline, they would have missed that opportunity. So there were ways that we're still learning about how to be flexible um, with the program and with the artists who we're in conversation with. Um, but from what I've seen from last year uh, of the neurodiverse artists who wanted to be a part of a festival, of the festival, they appreciated um, more flexibility with time, um, kind of different styles of communicating. And, you know, because we were so new and because we weren't um, too um, big up on any particular uh, kind of rules with how things were going to be run, mm. we were able to be a bit more flexible um, 
and yeah we ended up with with some incredible work in the in the program because of that but one of the things that I liked about how the actual festival ran was it went against something that I had found was quite common up to that point which was something online is going to be available one time one time only and if you miss that you know one and a half, half hour long event which wasn't recorded and won't go anywhere after that then you've missed it and I can understand why in person that is a thing you know you have an event that goes on in a theatre or goes on in a venue or a workshop space and then it's over and then you go home but for something like an online event you have the ability to record that quite easily and some artists even myself I get quite anxious with anything that is going to be online forever for an indefinite period of time so when I do events I like to say you know happy for this to be online for a couple of months or so or whatever I think a, a, th a few other people tend to do that or and then after that period it can be available to whoever you know emails the company to to watch it or or um, view it later that's one way of getting around um, an artist's uh, discomfort with the indefinite period that their work might be on the internet but equally it allows people who weren't feeling great that day or had work or you know worked late like night shifts to attend that event later on um having our festival run with a weekly sort of structure so you know everything was available for seven days and then the next things the next part of the program was available for seven days allowed people to find their own sort of time within their week to engage with that work and watch those films rather than rushing to watch everything within a day or a couple of days which you know some film festivals tend to do um, tend to limit uh, their performances to a shorter period of time so we just wanted everybody to be as relaxed as they could be during a pandemic during lockdown during isolation when most of us are the opposite of relaxed um, yeah no it's really interesting and it's particularly the point about um, online legacy actually as well I think I hadn't even considered that um, and this is obviously this session is being recorded but certainly something um, I'll, I'll look into in terms of um, where the you know these recordings then go and making sure that you know because god forbid I've seen things on YouTube from two th when I was about 15 that I would rather not see up there anymore <laughs> but um, it certainly is yeah pretty interesting not even when I was 15 god when I was at uh, university God. Um, I'll just, if we could just move on slightly, that was really, really uh, fascinating. Um, if I can just switch the move on to, um, so hypothetical scenario, I'm starting up a company or an organization or a festival, and it's going to be on digital events. Um, what are the key things I should keep in mind? And I'll ask you, Graham. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the heads up on that big nugget of a question there. <laughs> I'll just I'll just ease everyone in, Marley. Uh, I no, there's quite a lot to think about really, isn't there? I think I think um, I think we've we've all said it, and particularly in, um, in the, the sort of subject Jess is talking about in terms of you know that normal festival environment. I think I think I think everyone actually is, is saying the same things that there are some pretty big barriers out there and some big institutions and some, some big rules and this should give us all I think a, a bit of a moment to reconsider I mean because that as a festival we've worked in festivals all my adult life you know there's there's, there's elements of festivals of, of bringing people together and I think what we've discovered here is actually you can still bring a person together without them necessarily being there um, and, and that sort of journey so it's quite interesting to sort of keep that in our in our minds but I suppose thinking on think keep thinking of i always imagine who the audience is and what they're doing and um, so for us that was a case of um it's burns night which is a very easy one for us really because um you know it's whether whether people are um know what to expect and i think i think in, in our context people didn't really understand the alternative approach in terms of the way we create work um so we had to think about how that would land, how how the how how we created that. So obviously we looked at our, our 10 year history, looked at all the artists that we'd that we'd worked with and thought, who amongst these sends the message that we want to send? 
And I, and I guess for us, that was the, the audience were split in two, really. There was an audience that knew who we were and was, was hoping that we do something. And the second, which was the fact which became the biggest, was the audience that celebrated Burns Night um, or, or wanted to celebrate Burns Night with us. And so for us, actually, we had to think in terms of designing that, really. We had to go through that design process of going, OK, there's no point us um, having acts from La Haggis uh, and for panelists that don't know, it's a, it's a risky burlesque show um, it, that that wouldn't land well. And, you know, it, burlesque doesn't just land land that great on YouTube, does it? Or, you know, in terms of people understanding why we wanted to do that. So I guess um, figuring out that design plan and for us, I think what we what we really did really well was engage the artists that were going to be taking part and kind of collaborate with them. And I think there's been a real um I think across the board, actually, there's, there's been a real sort of breaking down of those um, conventional structures because anybody who books big artists know that there's there's kind of layers there. Uh, there's you know you relatively don't see the artists until they're in the dressing room. So when they're making when, and that's in big festivals. So when they're making big work, your connectivity to that um, is kind of is, is much further away. But because because they didn't understand digital, their agents that understand digital. We had to rewrite our contract. Um, so our, our, our main contract had to be re rewritten. And when we took that to um, sort of our, our umbrella organizations, they didn't have a clue. Uh, Association of Festivals, uh, Equity, back to, they were like, we don't know how you do this really. And although that was quite scary, that actually opened up an opportunity for us to go, could a, could a Zoom uh, with Donovan, um, you know, before we contract. Um, well, so, so it's just like, okay, what happens there? And then, so as a curator, you're sort of then having this kind of really brilliant conversation, telling the artist from the outset, this is what we want to achieve. Uh, does that connect with you? And immediately they tell you about their idea and it starts sparking. And I think, I think um, you know, that's definitely a plus that we've found actually, you, you, if, we could, if we could keep that, this idea of, um, being able to communicate with the artists that are producing the work. Um, and then apart from that, really, I think the other thing, the other thing that we really learned was, and, and digital lends itself really well for this, because if you think about it, there are so many different types of promotional outlet. There's print, there's outdoor, there's digital, there's PR, there's viral. But if you're making a digital show and the end product, uh, the end venue is a digital venue, it really helps you refine that process so you can stay on digital you still got decisions to make about it. You know, so for us, we um, took our audience onto Facebook and YouTube. So all of our uh, promotion was based on, um, you know, transfer uh, uh, an audience who were connecting with those platforms, who had some relativity or connection with us. And it's about us messaging those, those specifically. So we didn't invest in say billboards in uh, Leicester Square or in Princess Street Gardens. We invested actually in the, and the, the sort of um, channels that we were, or, 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 the, or, or the places we were likely to find that audience. Uh, a, a particularly brilliant one for us actually was the, the use of Facebook ev event. Um, so not only did we cultivate a, a, a little posse in, um, on Facebook, we were actually uh, sort of run promotional campaigns that targeted them and allowed us to kind of have a much stronger uh, voice with them. If you imagine the festival, if they'd saw the ad on Facebook, they would have went to the station hotel, they would have said, oh, here's your brochure, that's it. But we wouldn't have been able to onboard them quite as quite as well as uh, I think we did. And that's something I think uh, for digital events, it gives you that, that much closer relationship with the audience. You know, So when you bring them on board, we were able to send them messages. And I think actually, I don't know, I don't know if we did, but there was a sort of bit of a tart and revolution on Twitter on Burns Night because we'd been feeding the audience and telling them, yeah, it suddenly occurred to, occurred to us, I think, on a Friday, do you think they'll just sit at home and, and watch or will they participate? So we just sent out loads of content about, you know, like get your, get your tart and tutu on and, you know, like do the fandango around the living room. Like there's no rules here, go for it. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest learning from from digital, if, if we're just doing digital, 
for a small organization like ours, it gave us a, a chance to be really focused about how, how we build that audience and how we connect with them. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. It's really interesting that, that that spread in terms of your former demographic reach and how you you know re, you know talked to those audiences and how you kind of also replicated that, but also added all these new elements in terms of the digital outreach. Um, Mike and Hazel, I guess same question. Um, before starting a digital you know program or digital event, what are some of the key considerations you would need to make or that you've learned? Oh, I think you're still on mute, guys. Sorry. I'm dead to do it. Um, I guess that picks up on a couple of things that are in the chat, actually, about how do you make something human? You know, you were talking about what happens beforehand and what happens afterwards, because um, it was described, I think it was Angela described it as being quite abrupt, the ending of things. You can be left with that sense of no closure um, or actually, you know, scared to go into something. And how do you make that easy? So I guess, again, it's like Graham was saying, it's giving as much information and kind of creating an atmosphere beforehand. I mean, I, 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 we're answering this question differently to Graham and Jess, because we're not performers or curators. Um, we're, we're mainly facilitators. So we're kind of answering it from that perspective. The key thing to bear in mind, I would say, is that you're creating a space for people to meet. That, that's it. <laughs> that's the thing to bear in mind. You're creating a space for people to meet. That's all you have to keep in mind. And everything else follows from that. And so that's what we tried to do. And you, you think of all kinds of different things. You think, well, you know, to begin with, we were, with this gathering thing, we were thinking, well, what's, what's, what does your favourite pub feel like? You know, I mean, what, how does it, and they, I don't know if anyone's read that essay, Moon Underwater by George Orwell, right? the story of a pub that doesn't exist but it's an ideal place because it brings people together families together different types of people together not not a bloke's pub right a people's pub but what does that feel like and why is that different from other pubs so you you're looking at all kinds of areas for for inspiration and thinking as Hazel said, how does that work? How does that work from the moment that someone enters a space to the moment they leave? And they have some kind of sense of closure from that. So that's the first thing. It's a place for people to meet. The second thing I'd suggest is ensure you've got a fantastic team delivering it um, who are trying to make the technology as invisible as possible. So we always work with this brilliant person, Barbara Mertlover, who does actually all the technical production. So she's doing the breakout rooms. She's doing all that kind of stuff. So we don't have to think about it. We can facilitate. And people don't have to think about which breakout rooms they're going into uh, and so forth. So having a team, we usually have a team of three people doing an event. And you could do it with one. I think you'd have to go and lie down in a darkened room for several hours afterwards, you know, if it was just you on your own. Um, you could probably get away with two, but actually thinking who's going to be doing what to create this great space for people to meet, that's the key thing. No, it's such a great point and exactly what um, Kate said in the chat there um, about that kind of the humanization of, of, of digital space as well. Uh, Jess, did you, did, within your festival, did you have such things like gathering gathering events or was it very much a kind of platform and, and, and almost like a festival that you would kind of engage in different kind of films? Yeah, we had a few online events. Um, we had two roundtable conversations um, with artists who were taking part in the festival and people um who were from around the world who worked in um kind of community oriented uh projects themselves talking about art and connecting with different um populations in different communities so that was a really nice um series as in the festival for just opening opening our artists up to to our audiences but also connecting with some really really incredible um, community organizations around the world but we were definitely still um, you know unsure at the time about what made a good live event you know that I'd been to a, I'd been to a good few before August 
but I think some of my favorites are the ones that play music when you come into the room and you're just you just you just make your cup of tea and then the intro music is just playing for five minutes or so it allows everybody to come in a little bit late which even though everything is online I'm still usually about five minutes late to things because that is time and anything yeah that's just sort of more relaxed that way I think for me one of my biggest anxieties about online events is not knowing when you click the join button if um your camera is going to be on and I do not want to tell you the number of times I've been in my dressing gown and I've not been prepared to be seen by 45 people and so that's that's one way I think people who are running online events need to start thinking about um you know that immediate when you arrive in the event what can what can I expect as a viewer as an audience member from joining this room it's similarly in a similar way to how you enter a real room and you expect to either sit down uh, on some chairs or you think or you know it's going to be a standing event like what am I going to expect when I come to this space um, and I guess as a as a platform that maybe you get a reputation for being that platform that plays really nice music when you join in or maybe you give a little bit of a preamble on that event bright link or that email that you're sending out to, to warn people not warn but <laughs> to brief people on what to expect when they come in and that's something that I hope we we get a bit better at because we want to do a lot of online events um you know over the next few months running up to the festival so um yeah that's that's important for me I think just everything needs to be a little bit more uh again just a little bit less stressful really you can't replicate in person with online perfectly because it is a different space. But as you were saying, Mike, I mean, I I want to know how do you create an online event that's like sitting in a field, having a picnic with some people who you trust. And I'm yeah, still looking for the for the techniques for that. So <laughs> this has been really interesting for me. Yeah, it's <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really fascinating because you're dealing also with the context of of have, of a live event and still wanting to have that presence and that and that and that you know real kind of shine to something, but also you're dealing with people in their in their internal lives and and their internal places and the, and you know what's happening that day. Some you know, there I don't know about anybody else's schedule as well, but mine's has got very full all of a sudden. You know, just from the washing machine is right there. I think that's what I blame it on. What I can see, then I have to do. So, <laughs> um, I guess in terms of the moving kind of into the next kind of part, um, and just a kind of time notification, we're currently at five past seven. Uh, the event is scheduled to to run till half past, but we'll just kind of play it by ear if that's okay. And of course, if anybody you know needs to leave or whatever, including panelists, if you're suddenly like, right, no, I'm done. <laughs> Please just stay. Um, and we'll do our best but uh, in terms of what that whole kind of process is and all that you know all that we've learned uh, since the pandemic and doing digital work and doing digital events uh, moving platforms what are we taking away from it um, and particularly um, what was raised in a, with one of our members who's actually here with us Angela is on an access and inclusion point and um, so much has opened the doors have opened for so many people how do we move forward and make sure that they're not closed and that they don't close? Um, and Mike and Hazel, I guess, if you can, it's not specifically a question, but more sort of a cogitation, if you will. Um, how, how might we can, can continue to include people? I mean, I'm, yeah, I can't imagine how we can go back to doing things the way we used to. I mean, because we deliver quite a lot of work, um, stuff for the Scottish government, there's quite strict accessibility guidelines in place in, in, in terms of, you know, we, we only deliver stuff in accessible venues, et cetera. Um, we need, you know, we, we will get um, BSL interpreters um, for events, et cetera, et cetera. That's all given. But that thing about people who aren't able to come because they would need to access childcare, because they'd have to travel, um, you know, in unsustainable ways for short periods. I don't know how we can go back to what we used to do. We're going to have to do some sort of blended way of doing things or keep a lot of stuff online because it's just mm. better for a lot of people. Um, you know, why would you travel, you know, halfway across Scotland for a half day event? Why do you need to? 
does your event really need to be a half day? Could you actually just distill it down or do it, you know, in a different way? I think we need to be much more creative about how we work to let people live the lives that they want to do. We can't force people back. And I think we kind of used to make people come and do the way we wanted to deliver things. And I think everybody's realised there's different ways of doing it. And I think we have to, we have to honour that. Yeah, I think Kate's just put in the chat here, it's inspiring to move forward with our eyes more open. Mm -hmm. I th that's absolutely it. And I think we need to be inspired. We need to take all the positives that's come out of this last year. I mean, there's been some crap, there's been some horrible things happen, but let's hang on to the positive things. Let's move forward with that. There have been, we've been able to do things and our fellow panelists and others have been able to do things that we never would have been able to do before. We pushed ourselves forward. We learned how to do new things. We work with different people. We worked in different contexts, etc. We've got to take all that positiveness and all that innovation. Uh, look at it critically, look at it self-critically. Yeah, not everything's worked at all. Um, and yeah, how we get to that ideal field with friends that Jess was talking about, you know, that's that's maybe that's the the um, the kind of ideal state we want to aim to. We're not at all there yet, but we need to move forward um, uh, uh, based on what we've achieved and what we could do, and the the positive things about inclusion. I think that we've learned over the last year. Uh, absolutely. Um, Graham, same same kind of question, but I, I'm wondering, as we're, you know, Graham and I with Big Burn Supper and the Stove Network, we're based within Dumfries. And certainly whilst the move to an online platform has certainly opened doors to new audiences and new people, our, much of our agendas and much of our kind of purpose and being is, is around gathering and live gathering because it's as part of the placemaking and place identity. And I'm just wondering, you know, Graham, is it something that, you know, the stove and Big Burn Supper, not with, not getting into an internal discussion here, but is mm. it something, you know, how do how do we tackle that? How do you know in terms of maintaining an online presence, being inclusive, but also making sure that yeah. we're best with our town? I, I think that's a point well made by you, Martin, as well, because I think when I think of access, I'm, I'm, I think I think much in much broader terms. And I think about I think about poverty. I also think about some of the work we've collaborated on in terms of um, you know queer identity in, in rural places. And I can't help but think um, that you're right in saying that that um, as much as there's there's a lot to get out of a sort of queer digital uh, event um, in a place that there's no identifiable queer institute in 200 miles. Um, then the need for festivals and the stove and, and you know and guys like us to do that is really really important um, and also I think I was chatting to a colleague in London when um, just as, as lockdown was sort of just bubbling I think in around by that point about July and I, and I said and I meant it sincerely that in rural parts of uh, the UK we've never had it so good you know generally I said that I watched Hamlet uh, you know Gary's downloading Hamilton and NTS have just done another uh, 10, 10 short episodes and there's something about access that we have to think about in terms of uh, geographical isolation and I think I think it's it's you know it and, and as well as that once that work is available to us actually here's another thing how about including us how about getting us on on those platforms as well because Currently, much of the, the, the nucleus and creation, and definitely in Scotland, is still in the central belt. Um, so now that they've learned that we're here and that we ain't going anywhere, um, perhaps now they need to think much more broadly in terms of uh, could we actually, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's political, but the BBC are planning to evolve in different locations. And I think, um, I think that's probably what we need to be thinking about next uh, as a country. Actually, can we just stop making the central belt? so suited um, to, to its own geographic purpose, really. And I think if that comes out of this, it'll be, it'll be great. Going, going back to our festival in terms of uh, what we do, um, I remember we did a 2020 festival and our biggest, our biggest headache um, was, was um, the, the rise in, in, in wheelchair use 
And I know that sounds really, I'll be very careful what I say. We've done such a great effort to, to be uh, much more accessible, but the, the demand that, was, that, that had been placed on us um, to, because, because we did a great job, we actually weren't big enough to be able to handle it. I think our access um, tickets um, shot up by about 390% which just meant that actually the idea of it is, is great, but, but we hadn't actually really, we don't have the infrastructure uh, to deal with that. And that comes down to cost. So perhaps digital gives us an opportunity to, because I think we are quite well-meaning and, and I know the stove's well-meaning and everyone in Dumfries and Galloway that produces what wants to make it accessible. But if we don't have all of those um, uh, pieces of kit to be able to do it, um, then actually we're failing before we start. And it's great, actually, you know, our, our agenda was always, why, why can't uh, disabled people be at a gig standing, at, you know, or, or sitting at the front of the wheelchair? Um, but it, it, come, it comes with, with its own set of problems. I'm just reminded before, I, that I, as lockdown finished, or as lockdown was just starting, I think exactly two months before it, um, I, was, I was seconded to the Pinter Theatre in London. And I just want to, to, to leave people with this sort of, uh, the, the sort of stupidity of it but they, they were intent on recording Ian McKellen so it was one guy on stage uh, basically doing all these monologues uh, goes around the country and they were intent on on recording it so the National Theatre through N NT Live said okay we'll do it um, now in order for them to record that it was six cameras 48 crew um, about eight trucks outside the venue and they took out about 300 seats in the venue and I remember just watching it as a sort of novice going, yeah, this must be what, what making digital is all about. And I, and I felt quite petrified because I thought there's no way we could ever ever achieve that at our festival or any of, the, any of our peer organisations. And it's funny, isn't it? Because more or less exactly a year later, I think what we've learned is all that clunkiness, it's just, it just needs to stop, doesn't it? It's just really about, you know, and putting, putting sort of performance and culture back in our hands really and just, and just letting people uh, film what they want to film and, and, there's, and, and there's more power in that than necessarily because it's a massive organisation. I'm sure they did a great job. I haven't seen the film yet. Uh, but, but even Ian, he, he was like, what's all this for? You know, he's like, surely this could be, you know, I, you know surely I could just take my phone. <laughs> so there's lots to learn from that there. And I think, I think um, every curator will probably be looking um, and thinking, how, you know, not, not do we just, as someone said rightly, go back to the normal, but actually making, adapting and changing and, and walking into creation where our eyes wide open, as Kate says. Absolutely. Jess, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts around that in terms of infrastructure. I mean, you're obviously coming from a central belt kind of place, but obviously your work is much more around diversity and and visibility more than anything. Is it, is it a similar kind of comparable comparable, comparable state? too sure about the infrastructure I mean it's been it's been really great to have these connections and have work from artists who are you know, all around the world like we're not restricted by mm. borders or visas for anybody who can take part in part because I wouldn't even know how to navigate online visa working stuff anyway and I kind of refuse to learn but <laughs> I, in my mind you know if you have a film and you exist in the world then you can <laughs> share it with us if you like um, but yeah I guess it's a bit different um, one thing that I don't have I know I don't have an answer for and I'm kind of looking to see I want to speak to people who work in these fields really to know how they're coping and how they're navigating it like people who's livelihoods are dependent on the stage you know the set designers or the lighting the, some of those people who were in those big trucks for Ian McKellen you know putting that that stage together and you know what is what are their working opportunities if we do sort of strip back um and we keep things smaller or we give everybody a ring light and a really good phone camera like who yeah you know what are what are their opportunities the costume designers i mean obviously these roles will still exist when theaters are making work on stage and this kind of you know 
a 10 seats between a viewer kind of system. Um, you still need all those people involved. But from what I've seen with the people who've been put on furlough or the people who've been made redundant, who've worked uh, in festivals is it tends to be the people behind the scenes or the people who work in hospitality, people who work um, front of house who have, who have just lost all of their opportunities. And I want to know how, as a digital, exactly, um, I can't see who, who's posted this, but, you know, freelancers who don't have a, who don't have the structure of a, of a permanent contract have been hugely affected by the pandemic. And what can, what can the digital sphere do for, for set designers, do for lighting designers, people who can't do their work from home? Um, that's that's kind of what I what I want to know, and it's been a constant sort of question since um, lockdown has begun, and I haven't really seen um, this topic be sort of interrogated um, meaningfully by those organisations who kind of had a duty to look after their workers. That's an excellent point. An excellent point, um, Arun. It's not just the one thing, it's an entire spectrum, an entire world of, of freelance workers. Um, we're kind of wrapping up now um, and just wanted to kind of throw it out really if there's any kind of uh, further thoughts or, or questions um, within the panel and also to our audience as well. Um, so just, yeah, any final thoughts or, or anything like that? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one from Angela here. Uh, just to be clear, there are many needs of disabled people that require funding, but imagine if you upskilled those people to be writers, performers, artists themselves, what a massive participation increase that could mean, which as we know also is so important for well-being and health. Absolutely. <laughs> I think um, I think that that's good actually. I'm, I'm glad someone's made that point. Um, for, the, for our online edition with Junie Godley, there's there's two things I remember. The first one was Janie Godley's husband, Ian, doesn't is, has autism and, and doesn't feel comfortable in gigs. So it was brilliant to engage them after the show because he was he was so um he had so much to say. Um and that's a really obvious one. It's like actually this is my wife and she's been part of the show. So I was able to I was able to take part in, in that process. So that's that's worth us thinking about, isn't it? It's just going, you know, maybe for us actually what we'll, we'll, what we're sort of contemplating and it, and it is just contemplating we could do it forever i hope not but it, you know if you take a if you take a structure of a show um at a festival like ours how hybrid can you make that experience and as mike said actually he said about you know that, that producers and that maybe maybe they facilitate actually I, I agree with you i think i think as curators we are facilitators as well uh, we don't just book the show and put it on um, actually we try and create that festivalized journey for people um, and then the second thing I was thinking uh, I agree with um, what someone said there about about you know um, disabled performers uh, taking center stage there as well and I think I think that that curation has to be there from the outset and I, and I would encourage people just to be bold and I think I shared this with you Martin but we stumbled across an idea um, that Robert Softley Gale, who's the artist director of Birds of Paradise, we were like, what would um, what would Thomas Shanter sound like if someone with cerebral palsy um, said it? Um, and what if someone with a cerebral palsy with a very strong distinctive Glasgow accent and then thinking in terms of access, how would that sound? And so we recently just picked up the phone and said, would you do it? And he goes, that's, that's cheeky and bold at the same time. And I guess it's just about knowing, knowing, knowing who would be up for doing that, really. Um, and we could have failed, and I'm sure much of what Jess is talking about um, is about just going out there and, and, and saying, let's try it. But we mustn't be scared to, to have a shot at that. And although, actually, we were able to, we're quite proud that that Tama Shanta now exists in Scottish Archive, that we've done that and it's there. Um, when it came to captioning, um, we just didn't have enough uh, uh, cost or, or, or scale of budget to be able to take that same and it was and it actually it was the it was the I don't know if people understand how YouTube captioning works but you know they, they, they can necessarily do a little bit for you um, 
but there was the nuances of the Glasgow accent that, that we knew that might slip us up coming from both Robert and uh, Janie Godley, that those terms that the captioners just wouldn't, if they were international, wouldn't be able to do so. Um, so so but I, I feel that's okay. I, I feel it's okay for us to then go out with that process and say, when we do it again, and we will, that uh, actually we'll need just to make sure that, that that's been considered, really. I guess, like, as a lasting comment I think like we shouldn't ever really be in a position where we can't provide something as, as key as captions for example because we don't have the funds I think Scotland should have more arts funding specifically for these purposes you know there are some pots here and there for depending on the type of festival depending on the type of work that you can apply for but it can be very difficult to navigate the, the funding routes in Scotland, in Scotland, and it can also be very competitive and very limited. And, you know, I think that there's a big um, responsibility for, uh, yeah, funders to make sure that there is money there to ensure that we can do what we have to do for our audiences. Um, because there are so many access tools that could be provided, you know, Captions, subtitles, really key, really important. Sign language interpretation. Sign language in itself is is very nuanced, and it it depends on again the language of the location that the person is living in, which kind of sign language they use, and you know not everybody speaks English. So if you're really trying to be international or connect with lots of people, why are all of your captions only in English? So I would love to see um, more specific funding routes for specifically for access tools um, being promoted, being easy to apply for, because again, forms for some of these funders are really, really complicated and long. Um, I think, yeah, that's that's what I would like to see change sort of within that sector to help us do the, the work that we're trying to do. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more on that from that, that level. Uh, Mike and Hazel, uh, any kind of parting words? <laughs> yeah, I think, as Mike was saying earlier, you know, we have, we've learned so much over the last year um, that we can just take forward with us and just see things more clearly, hold on to the good things and, yeah, make everything as welcoming to as wide an audience as we possibly can more conversations like this yeah. between people that engage an audience on this kind of scale this is the scale that you need it rather than some big broadcast where we kind of share from different perspectives what our experience has been um, and we share that with people who have a, an interest in it and then we just try and take take it forward i think we will look back on this period in lots of different ways but one way that we'll look back it's when doing things digitally actually you know kind of entered a new age and there were a whole range of new possibilities that opened up and I think our responsibility is to ensure that we we carry that forward in a way that is as accessible inclusive and democratic as it possibly can be there's lots of positive things that we've achieved and let's just yeah go forward with them not that I like the phrase going forward there, I just said it, yes, <laughs> dreadful. Uh, yes, <clears throat> just as I've got a slight mad mind map, which I will try and put into some kind of like form and send out to, to anyone who, who needs it and it will be available online uh, as will this uh, conversation. Um, we're basically with the soapbox, we're going to go five weeks of these kind of conversations and then we'll move online and it will be part of our digital hub for members and audiences across the world to engage with. Um, I would like to thank every single one of you. It's been a really inspiring conversation, probably way more inspiring than I kind of previously envisaged. And uh, I'd just like to, yes, sincerely thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone that's come along. Um, and I'm sorry, after all that learning about kind of humanizing space, I don't quite know what, to, know what to do, but end it. <laughs> so apologies. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you, Jess, uh, Mike, Hazel and Graham.